everyone. Hello. I'm Barbara Gaines. I'm the artistic director of Chicago Shakespeare Theater. And yay! And we are so happy to be hosting you. This is, um, this is an honor for us. You can't imagine how moved we all are by your work. When uh, the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library Foundation and the Roger and Chaz Ebert Foundation approached us with the idea of hosting No Malice Film Contest, we jumped at the chance to showcase the work of these most talented young filmmakers. We celebrate you today, you wonderful people. We celebrate your remarkable achievements. Um, I, I, my life sort of started in the movie business because my grandfather and dad and then my brother all all had jobs, you know, somewhere in the moving picture industry. And um, so this means a whole lot for us to be marking your future in film. Um, the No Malice Film Contest shows us the powerful vision of younger people. As adults, we must listen to them. And then we must, we must act to make the world better. Congratulations to all of, all of you young filmmakers. We are, I am, in awe of your passion, your craft, your creativity, and the blessed ever efforts of you to promote racial healing within this very, very troubled world of ours. You are our future and our hope and uh, I wish you all the luck in the world, although I don't need to wish you any talent because that you have in hundreds of millions of ways. So, I am right now going to introduce the president and CEO of the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library Foundation, Aaron Carlson Mast. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you, Barbara. We are delighted to celebrate the winners and premiere the winning films of the No Malice Film Contest here today. And a big thanks to all of our friends at the Chicago Shakespeare Theater for your hospitality. We are thankful to our generous supporters, including the Dr. Scholl Foundation and Healing in Illinois, a racial healing initiative of the Illinois Department of Human Services in partnership with the Chicago Community Trust. President Abraham Lincoln appreciated the arts and had a particular fondness for the works of William Shakespeare. Lincoln was known to critique the performances of actors he felt had missed the deeper meanings and historical context of Shakespeare's plays. Lincoln enjoyed Shakespeare, yes, but it wasn't just enjoyment. He appreciated the truths that Shakespeare's works revealed about the human condition. John Hay, one of Lincoln's secretaries, recalled that, quote, the plays Lincoln most affected were Hamlet, Macbeth, and the series of histories. Among these, he never tired of Richard II. The terrible outburst of grief and despair into which Richard falls in the third act had a peculiar fascination for him. Grief was a feeling Lincoln knew all too well. As president during the Civil War that tore the nation apart, he struggled with monumental issues like oppression and freedom, injustice and justice. When he could, he sought moments of relief in the arts, literary humor, music, and the theater. He was judged for it. Another secretary, William Stoddard, recalled, quote, there were some persons even then who criticized the president severely for his heartless wickedness in ever going to a theater or listening to music or any such frivolity at a time when the affairs of the nation required him to sit in a corner and weep, as if Lincoln wasn't attending to his responsibilities. During the war, a pair of visitors who came to see Lincoln were so stunned by his appearance, they told him he should get away for a few weeks, relax and have a vacation. He told them, it would do me no good. He said, my thoughts, my solicitude for this great country, follow me wherever I go. Surely his thoughts followed him into the theater, just as our thoughts follow us into this theater here today. We are living in challenging times, 
In his own, Lincoln called on his contemporaries to think anew and act anew to rise to those challenges. Today, we honor 10 young filmmakers who have done just that. You have risen to the challenge. You point to injustices and solutions to bind up our nation's wounds. You have offered new perspectives on the past and the present and visions of what the future could or should be. We are thrilled we could come together to celebrate you here today. And now, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our Master of Ceremonies, Chaz Ebert. Hello, I am so glad to be here, so glad that you are here. I'm really excited for several reasons. Number one, because we have our filmmakers with us and they did a wonderful job and we're going to see their films today. But I'm gonna give you also a kind of Hollywood reason I'm glad to be here today. Tonight are the Emmy Awards, but today we're giving you the Abe Awards. And I have no doubt that one day, some of the filmmakers here, or maybe some of our students from Columbia who are here, or some of the other people who are in this very audience, I promise you, we're going to see them at the Emmys, or the Oscars, or the Independent Spirit Awards, because that's the spirit that I see in the filmmaking we had here. Now, let me see. They have some prepared remarks here for me. But before I get to the re prepared remarks, I got to give you the Chaz remarks. You know that this weekend, we had people going up into space on, it was the first manned uh, spaceship by civilians, not professional astronauts. And they went far beyond uh, the, the line of space so they could look back on the Earth. And we know that over 50 years ago, man actually walked on the moon. What we may not know is before that walk on the moon, we've all heard of Apollo 11, but not many people have heard of Apollo 8. Apollo 8 was the first time that astronauts went up so high so they could look back down at the Earth. And that's when they discovered the Earth looked like they called it the, the little blue marble. And so they looked and they saw that all the continents, we think of our Earth as being so big, seven continents spread out all over. What they discovered is that it was so small compared to everything else that we were all connected. That something that happened in the water in the Indian Ocean affected us who lived in Lake Michigan. That it wasn't so big and disparate that you could do whatever you wanted to do without regard to your fellow person. And that's when we discovered a lot of scientific discoveries were made after that. And a lot of organizations on Earth were formed after that that talked about bringing humanity together. The Environmental Protection Agency was one of those agencies that were formed because we said it matters. It matters what we do. It matters how we dispose of our waste. It matters. There are other organizations within the UN that were formed because they said it matters. If somebody's hungry in Africa, it matters in the United States. We can't just go living our lives willy-nilly, doing whatever we want to do without regard to our neighbor. We discovered in a scientific way that the golden rule do unto others as you would have them do unto you, was really 
a good rule. It's called a golden rule for a good reason. And so when Angela Sterren at the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library Foundation and others decided to come up with this contest, they said, what is it that our 16th president, Abraham Lincoln, would think of this time in our history? This was 2020. A virus had stopped the world, the whole world. The coronavirus was here, and we said, what can we do? The whole world was shut down. Do you know that for one day on Earth, the air quality in Los Angeles, which is really usually pretty foggy and dirty, was the cleanest on Earth? That because, that's because everything was shut down. All work, all play, all school, all industry, everything was shut down. You could go up and you could look down through the ocean and it was so clear. You could see everything. And do you know what I'm hoping this contest will do? As clear and beautiful as the earth looked, I'm hoping that this contest and these films that these young filmmakers have made will make us think and make us open our hearts and open our hearts to be as pure and clean as the ocean and as the air when we all had to stop and think about what we were doing. My mother always said, you can use a lot of words, kindness, compassion, empathy. She said, it really all boils down to love. And that is what I'm hoping will be the legacy of this No Malice film contest. Thank you. Now I'm gonna go back to my scripted remarks. I'm so excited to see our filmmakers and their friends and families. And I'm so proud of and moved by your work in our No Malice Film Contest. The contest's name was inspired by Lincoln's second inaugural address in which he called for Americans to end slavery and rebuild the nation with malice toward none, with charity for all. As Aaron mentioned, our beloved 16th president called upon Americans to bind up the nation's wounds, to heal from our national wounds, we must be open to acknowledging people's pain and their lived experiences with racism, which is what unites us all this afternoon. We created the No Malice Film Contest to help continue the unfinished work of equality as part of the Healing Illinois Initiative. We chose filmmaking to help in this cause because films have a unique power to change hearts and minds, to portray lived experiences across time and space, and to expand our perception and our empathy. It was important to direct our contest to young people so that the next generation who is leading us to a better place has a chance to be heard and inspire real action and systemic change. Before we show the winning films and talk with the filmmakers, I would also like to thank our group of professional filmmakers and film critics who wanted to help young people create art about race. Five acclaimed filmmakers, Troy Pryor, Rita Colburn, Pamela Sherrod Anderson, Steve James, and Sean Taylor have created moving works in their own careers and shared their knowledge with aspiring filmmakers through online workshops. The CHA program and documentary filmmaker, director Lillian Calfee, who is pretty spectacular, created a filmmaking in the classroom seminar for teachers to get schools involved. The contest films were judged by a panel of 21 professional film critics and filmmakers who were impressed by the creativity and empathy displayed by the filmmakers. And I know we have some of the judges with us here today. We have Omar Mosafar, if you can stand up, 
We don't have a light to show you, but just at least stand up. Thank you. Niani Scott was one of our film judges. And Sarah Adamson is here, one of our judges. And I think that Sean Taylor is here as well. Oh, yes. Thank you. We are grateful to everyone who contributed their time and talent. But without further ado, I'm pleased to present, let me just tell you the order of things so you won't be surprised. We're going to do all of the third place winners first, and then we'll do the second place winners and show their films and they'll come up in first place. So, without further ado, I'm pleased to present the third place winners in each of the three categories. Jessica Wong was a third place winner who tied for her film, Racial Justice, in the 11 to 14 age group. Uh, I'm, not, I'm calling their name, but you're not coming up yet. Uh, Abigail Eldridge was a third place winner who tied for, with Jessica Wong, her film, We the People, in the 11 to 14 age group. Azalee Irving was a third place winner for Interracial Relationships in the 15 to 18 age group. It's okay to clap. And Zach Nathine Lucan was a third place winner for Hate is Not Welcome Here in the 19 to 21 age group. You can clap for the filmmakers, then we're gonna, lights will go down and we're gonna see their films. gathered with the permission of the person who lives there. This is private property! You cannot do it! Honor of 
Breonna Taylor to mark the anniversary of her death in a botched police raid. Her mother insisting she will continue to fight to see the officers involved face criminal charges. People see Black Lives Matter as the civil rights struggle of our time. It's a bunch of frustrated people who are taken to the streets who don't have any, they don't view themselves as having any other path to go. Do you condone the violence? I don't condone nor I condemn the violence, but you can't keep treating people the way that we're being treated and expect them not to last. Last day, February 3rd, and uh, about 8 o'clock, I was at the, uh, the L train. I stood there quietly, a man came, and I uh, stood beside me. He started kicking my, uh, my bag. He came towards me. I thought he's going to punch me. But when I didn't feel anything, I saw his hand with a, uh, with a boxer uh, cutter. I shouted for help, but uh, nobody helped me. So far. Attacks continue everywhere. This gutsy 75-year-old woman gave an alleged attacker a lot more than he bargained for. She says she fought back with that stick. He said, and then he told us, like, they found him, got assaulted. He got an um, injury very bad about his brain breathing, and he never wake up again. I never see him again. Francisco grandfather had just received the vaccine when an unprovoked attacker ran across the street. When day comes, we ask ourselves, where can we find the light in this never-ending shade? The loss we must carry, a sea we must wade. We've braved the belly of the beast. We've learned that quiet isn't always peace. And the norms and notions are, of what just is, isn't always just ice. And yet the dawn is ours. Before we knew it, somehow we do it. Somehow we weathered and witnessed a nation that isn't broken, but simply unfinished. What we, the successors of a country and a time where a skinny black girl descended from slaves and raised by a single mother can dream of becoming president, only to find herself reject reciting for one. And yes, we are far from polished, far from pristine, but that doesn't mean we are striving to form a union that is perfect. We are striving to forge a union that, with purpose, to compose a country committed to all cultures, colors, and characters and conditions of man. And so we lift our gaze not to what stands between us, but what stands before us. We close the divided because we know to put our future first. We must first put our differences aside. We lay down our arms so we can reach out our arms to one another. We seek harm to none and harmony for all. Let the globe, if nothing else, they say this is true. That even as we grieved, we grew. That even as we hurt, we hoped. That even as we tired, we tried. That we'll forever be tied together, victorious. Not because we will never ever again no defeat, but because we will never ever again sow so division. Scripture tells us to envision that everyone shall sit under their own vine and fig tree, and no one shall make them afraid. If we're to live up to our own time, then victory won't lie in the blade, but in all the bridges we've made. That is the promise to glade, the hill we climb, if only we dare. It's because being American is more than the pride we inherit. Is the past we step into and how we repair it. We've seen a force that would shatter our nation rather than share it. We'll destroy our country meant, meant delaying democracy. And this meant very nearly succeeded. But while dem democracy can be periodically delayed, it can never be permanently defeated. In this truth, in this faith, we trust. For while we have our eyes on the future, history has its eyes on us. This is the era of just redemption. We feared as its inception. We did not feel prepared to be the heirs of such a terrifying hour, but within it we found the chapter, or we found the power to author a new chapter, to offer hope and laughter to, to, to ourselves. So while once we asked, how could we possibly prevail over catastrophe?
Now we assert, how could catastrophe possibly prevail over us? We will not back to what was, but move to what shall be. A country that is bruised but whole, ben benevolent but bold, fierce and free, we will not be turned around or interrupted by intimidation, because we know our interaction inertia will gather the inheritance of the new generation. Our blunders become their burdens, but one thing is certain. If we merce merge mercy with might and might with right, then love becomes our legacy. A change our children's birthright. So let us leave behind a country's better than the one we were left with. Every breath of my bronze-pounded chest. We will raise this wounded world into a wondrous one. We will rise from the gold-limbed hills of the west. We will rise from the wind-swept northeast, where our forefathers first realized revolution. We will rise from the lake-rimmed cities of the north and the midwestern states. We will rise from the sun-baked south. We will rebuild, reconcile, and, rediscover, and recover. In every known nook of our nation, and every corner called our country, our people, diverse and beautiful, will emerge, battered and power and beautiful. We will... When day comes, we step out of the shade, aflamed and unafraid, for the for the new dawn blooms as we free it. For there's always light, if we're only brave enough to see it. If we're only brave enough to be it. Amanda Gorman, The Hill We Climb. When day comes, we ask ourselves, where can we find the light in this never-ending shade? When I was born, I was assigned to a foster family and stayed in Homewood, Illinois up until the age of two years old. And although the social worker said that we had to lose contact, I continued to visit. Our family consisted of two sons that were each from our parents' previous marriages and two sisters born into marriage. My foster mom is African American and my foster father is fully Caucasian. I am African American, as you can see. I have noticed that from the outside looking in, the ones of the lighter complexion in our family are mistaken as fully Caucasian. I've gotten multiple questions on how it feels to live with white people and why I speak as if I'm white. In this family, race doesn't play a part in how we love each other. Our mother comes from a big family where you can range from a bright yellow to the darkest richest brown, teaching her that loving one by skin color is beyond her eyes. Our father, believes that people who treat other races in a minority matter have never interacted or built a relationship with that race to learn and skin color does not determine if you respect or disrespect that person. We also have grown up with a diverse range of friends. This has come from our parents raising us to be positive, optimistic, and respectful while making relationships with the person of another culture and to not belittle or mock them. This family has gotten each other the most amazing gifts. We've also shared the most amazing times together. From growing up and having our father push us on the swings in our backyard, to joining our mom on her workouts, watching the fireworks together on the 4th of July, sitting together watching a movie, enjoying a cookout, or eating dinner at the table. There's no such thing as talking white or sounding like a white person just because I was taught to fully pronounce my words and syllables and to speak in proper sentences. Being raised in a biracial home doesn't determine how I behave towards people of other races. I wasn't raised to hate or disrespect a person, no matter their ethnicity. Children are born innocent and are taught racism. It is a learned behavior. Our parents have been treated poorly due to their complexions. Mom said that during her music career, despite her being a beautiful singer, she often remembers times of still battling to win the crowd over. They decided to break the vicious cycle, allowing for us to raise our own in a healthy generation with diversity. This allows me to build positive connections with different cultures, allowing me to join programs and travel. I'm able to have conversation with people of my workspace. I went to school with different cultures without the feeling of being left out or making someone feel left out. There's been times I've been treated with disrespect for being African American. I've been told I look suspicious in nice neighborhoods. I've been followed around stores before. I've had people grab their belongings as I'm passing by. I've seen blackface. I hear the stereotype jokes on Family Guy. 
I see how you pull your children closer to you as I glance. I've had cuffs on that were purposely too tight. I've been denied service. And what have I done? Come to terms with myself. Been the bigger person. I've accepted that this has been going on for years now, and it will be going on for years after I'm gone. It can be fixed, although it can't be fixed overnight. I can do my part by raising my children to be diverse and teaching them to raise their children like that and to continue and break the chain of hate, stereotypes, and racism. Hate is not welcome here. Hate is not welcome here. Hate is not welcome here. You're better than that. I am better than that. We are better than that. What is hate? What is hate? Hate is non acceptance It's something that drives people away. Separation. Hate is poison. Hate is the strongest dislike for people or ideas just because. Hate is something we need to fight. Hate is something we need to fight against. Hate is not welcome here. Stop the prejudice. Stop the slurs. Stop the beatings. Stop the killings. And most importantly, Stop the hate. Let go of our bitter past and embrace our better future. In one word, how did the George Floyd video make you feel? Yeah, it was a lot of words. Uh... It made me feel sad. Disgusting. Frustrated. Scared. Disgusted. I'm welcome. Disgusted. Angry. How can we be better? As a society, how can we be better? It's time to have some crucial conversations. It's time to dialogue about the issues and problems that are facing our society. It's time to take the mask off. It's time to have some heart-to-heart -heart conversations. How can we be better? How can we do better? 
how can we heal? Change. A change must happen in order for us to move. Because all it is is change. Change isn't always a bad thing. Our country was based off of change. I wouldn't be here standing right now talking to you if it wasn't for change. You can do this. I can do this. We can do this. Do this for me. Do this for you. Do it for our family. For our nation. Do this for our kids. And let's do this for our future. Don't judge me based off the color of my skin. Or how my hair looks. The way I talk. Or the way I walk. Hate is not welcome here. Hate is not welcome here. So what an incredible range of films. And one of the things that we made sure we didn't do was define what racial healing is. We wanted to leave that up to the filmmakers. And as you can see, some of the filmmakers looked at it from an individual perspective. Some of them looked at it from a familiar perspective. Some looked at it from a societal perspective. So we are sorry that Jessica Wong could not be here with us today, but her film, Racial Justice, was very powerful. Um, the, let me see. I want to show you. So this is Jessica Wong's award, but we have the other filmmakers to present. We're going to present awards to them, but we need, oh. One moment. Let me stick to the script. I'm getting ahead of myself. Ah, the questions first. I do have to tell you this. All of the filmmakers received monetary awards in addition, but we decided we didn't want to hold up those big checks that you see at different award ceremonies. We're going to give them actual awards and they got their checks very discreetly and individually, ranging from $500 to $2,000. So. I'd like to begin our questions with Abigail Eldridge, our third place winner from the 11 to 14 category. Abigail, our judges loved your use of research in your film, We the People, and thought the reading of The Hill We Climb from Amanda Gorman was a powerful and unique inclusion. Can you tell us what inspired you to make your film and how do you hope it will help with racial healing? In my life, I've met many people from different cultures and many different races. I've known some people that have had problems of people calling them names, just being all around mean to them, just because of who they are, how they were born. They can't help that. No one can. I just want them to feel like they're wanted because they are. Everybody's wanted. Everybody's okay being who they are and what they want to be. Doesn't matter what their skin color, what their heritage is. It just matters that they're here and they're being who they want to be. Beautiful, Abigail. Thank you. Good 
Azalee Irving. This film was called Interracial Relationships. And our judges said it was beautifully written, a heartfelt message. There's a spider up here. <laughs> With a personal plan for the future. Azalee, what inspired you to make your film? And how do you hope it can help with racial healing. One moment, I need to ask the, the stage director a question. Okay, since we don't have individual microphones for everyone, they have to keep their masks on and stay safe. So we're gonna ask you to speak louder and really enunciate so the audience can hear you. Just imagine you're out there on the Oscar stage. Okay. Hi. Uh, this is crazy. Thank you everybody for being here. Um, what insi inspired me to make my film? Just the diversity and growing up, living on the South Side, being African-American within African-American family versus growing up in Homewood with a biracial family, just a difference. Um, I wanna let everybody know that we are all together. We're all one. We've all come from something. I hope my film inspires people to continue to bring people together, to continue to end the racism ways, to continue to move forward. I would love if everybody continues to raise the youth and our future to just be diverse and to just include everyone because you never know the impact another person could make on your life. So thank you. Thank you. Now, Zach, your film, Hate is Not Welcome Here, was for the 19 to 21 age group. And the judges mentioned that it seemed very personal and intimate. And one judge said that hate is not welcome here, takes a common narrative structure and gives it a better, more profound purpose. Zach Nathine, what inspired you to make your film and how do you hope it can help with racial healing? Yeah, so I'll try to give a good answer, like these two here, those very beautiful answers by them. Um, but really, I wanted to give a simple uh, shot, a simple, you know, narrative. Um, that's why I use the, the simple, uh, you know, face on shot and the shot to the left and the black and white palette. Um, the, the film itself is based off of a billboard in my hometown of Lincoln, Illinois, that said, hate is not welcome here. Um, it was black and white, just real simple. And I thought, you know, that'd be a great way to just get the message of, across. Just something simple, to the point, hate is not welcome here. And, you know, I hope that this film, with its simple narrative, can, can drive home the fact that, you know, we shouldn't be judging, uh, you know, others off of, you know, as I said, the way they talk, the way they walk, the way they look, how their hair looks, anything. It, you know, I, I was, you know, raised to be, you know, to not really judge people, but, you know, to base somebody off of their, uh, you know, who they are as a person, their characteristics, their personality. It's not always about the looks. It's never about the looks, really. Oh, wonderful. That's beautiful. <laughs> you know, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said we should judge people not by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. And I think that's exactly what you're saying. Now we have Angela Starin from the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library Foundation here to give the prizes. Thank you. Oh, I think someone's getting some flowers. Thank you. Now I'm excited to introduce the films of the second place winners. So 
the, as you can see, we had three different categories of ages in the contest, 11 to 14, 15 to 18, and 19 to 21. So, in the second place winners, Racial Healing in Oppressed Communities by London Shields. And I, you know, I don't know yet, did London Shields make it here? Oh, okay, all right. Well, we're going to, um, we see the films first, all right? And um, Puzzles by Sean Emanuel Atienza. And we have A Call to Fight Lies from the 19 to 21 age group by Mike, Michael Proctor. And I know that Michael Proctor is here, and I think he's here with like a twin brother. So let's have the lights and let's watch the second place winners of the films. Thank you. Hi, I'm London Shields, and today we're going to be discussing racial healing and the historic incidents that have made it necessary. Racial healing is a collective term for the ways a group of people cope with, resist, and find happiness in spite of oppression. The end goal of racial healing is to demolish systems and policies that cause harm and to create new, beneficial rules in their place. For African Americans, racial healing has occurred in response to the traumatic effects of the chattel slave trade, which began as early as the 1500s. For modern African Americans, racial trauma comes in the form of police brutality, systemic discrimination, and bigotry. At the same time, black people have always found hope, excitement, and purpose to push them through horrid times. Today, our racial healing takes many forms. Community organizing, art making, protests, rest, laughter, celebration, song, and dance. In short, oppressed people use racial healing to protect and rejuvenate ourselves and our loved ones. Racism affects all of us in all aspects of our lives. It determines where some are allowed to live, work, or play. It can determine the class size and resources of a child's school, impacting the quality of their education. It can segregate our cities, making some neighbors dangerous for different races to visit. More so, racism can lead to job discrimination and hate crimes in the workplace. This cycle keeps important job fields like medical, government, and legal positions dominated by high-income white Americans. This can severely impact the income of households of color as well as the quality of service and safety that people of color receive. However, it is vital to remember that our present biased policies and laws are a direct result of the inhumane systems of the past. Racial healing requires that conflicting groups tell the truth about past wrongs created by individual and systemic acts. In turn, racial healing requires us to acknowledge and reflect on the present consequences of those actions. Once dialogue starts, the racial healing process can begin. In these conversations, there are three things that need to happen to ensure racial healing. Number one is listening to each other's experiences. Number two, conceptualizing our experiences within the systems we live. And number three, we must use what we have learned to continue creating a safer world for one another. In order for conflicting groups to dialogue, they must first gather in a mutual space. Dialogue may take the form of a conversation between two people, a debate with two large groups, or mediate a conversation of some kind. It is this first step that allows the conflicting groups to clearly state the problems at hand. This then allows us to discuss our individual experiences and perspectives on the issues at hand. 
After listening, we can move towards the second step, understanding each other's experiences in relationship to the systems we live in. When people of two different races or income discuss, for example, their experiences at a hospital, they are bound by wildly different experiences. A well-off white American patient may experience kindness from medical staff and urgent affordable care. In contrast, a black woman with low income may be treated apathetically by nurses, diagnosed incorrectly, drugged or prescribed haphazardly, or even flat out have her claims of illness denied by bigoted doctors. If we want to correct injustices, we have to listen to learn the ways that we are treated differently. It is our jobs as individuals to use empathy dialogue and community organizing to increase economic and educational access for ourselves and those with limited resources. Only through the process of racial healing can we, as a country and as a world, move towards equity and peace. The surge in hate crimes against Asian Americans only getting worse. The and some calls of the for accounts police reform are following more violent. deadly shootings. An US Asian Attorney American General Merrick viciously Garland beaten on a New York City subway. And, and we're waiting to hear from the family of Andrew Brown after viewing body cam footage of his fatal police shooting. The 42-year-old father of seven was shot and killed by deputies who were reportedly executing warrants related to fatal shootings in Chicago. The shooting was reported on Well, that was a lot to take in. So many, in fact, that most of the time we just want them to magically disappear. But that is not possible. Taking a look at all of these problems, just solving one already seems like it's impossible. That one's climate change. This is hunger. And this one's homelessness. But for this right now, we're just gonna focus on this one. Racism. Now, like the other problems over there, sometimes we just want it to solve itself. But that's not realistic. So we have to grab all these problems, solve it ourselves. Personally, I think that a good first step is for all of us to recognize that it's a problem and that we want to solve it. And I think a lot of people are already working to do that. Because we are tired of being scared. People are just tired of all this hate and violence. Um, are you afraid of it? Na mangyari yun sa inyo or sa akin sa mga kakilala niya? Of course, kasi from hearing or watching TV, makikita mo kung ano yung experiences ng ibang tao. So, yun, you have, ano na, kapag ka lalabas ka na hopefully hindi mo ma-encounter yung ganong instance based uh, nowadays. Okay. Okay. And from knowing that, we can start with a solution. Like with any puzzle, starting with the center and building a good foundation is a good way to start. In other words, introspection, being aware that you have biases, and having that determination to correct yourself will be a great foundation. From there comes learning about and understanding our differences. Knowing what makes us the same and what makes us different and appreciating our diversity creates a special connection between all of us. Building off of that, our next step should be doing what 
we know already works which involves talking to one another you know having those difficult conversations for us to change and for us to heal we should let those who were hurt by the violence and the hate tell us about their stories and about how they feel and after that I think it just comes down to repeating this process of self-reflection and strengthening connections through conversation hopefully everybody will be will learn to be a good person <laughs> mahirap gawin mm -hmm. pero sana we learn to uh, be kind I was your typical dude, uh, an accountant, uh, a worship leader in my church. Uh, I love singing and praising God. Today is an important day. Today there's an anniversary. Celebrating my death. This time, jurors in the murder trial of a white former Dallas police officer who shot and killed her black neighbor. Stuff like this happens all the time. Whether uh -huh. motivated by racism uh -huh. or Not whether it's way. an accident, Not this way. it's inexcusable. It happens every day in this country. And so, what do we do about it? How do we heal? To answer this question, I sought out the opinion of those who are much more wise than I am. Here's what they had to say. Racism is real. Racism is, is a bias that people take on with themselves, which is culturally driven. Trying to define it is hard, but racism, judging someone on you know, looking down on someone, feeling that they're inferior because of physical characteristics like skin color, um, it's, uh, it's a real thing that happens. And the feelings people have are real. But the actual concept of racism is not based on anything as far as fact. There's no facts, there's no truth, there's no science behind it at all. This is one of the biggest lies that's ever happened that someone because of physical characteristics is somehow inferior and uh, racism is real but what it's based on is not if racism then isn't based on anything but it is real then where does it come from racism is not something that is inherent amongst human beings. Basically it's a 400 year old lie. If all racism is, is just a lie, then who's responsible for this lie? I guess any, anybody that has superior feelings about other people are, first of all, they are responsible. The responsibility goes on parents and 
in communities and neighborhoods and gossip and slander and dirty stories and so I do think we're, we're morally responsible as individuals but there's a lot of blame to go around and some of that blame uh, goes to moms and dads who learned it from their moms and dads who learned it from their moms and dads so it's a generational thing like I said it's a 400 year old lie it's generational evil we did not create it it was created a long time ago but we we do keep it alive understanding that this is generational does not make it okay does not justify it but at least offers an explanation but it does not fix these long-term effects. Self-value and worth is something that is eroded due to racism. When you think about what it means to walk in a room and to know that right away you might not be to the level of everyone else in the room without there being any basis <laughs> no basis whatsoever but it's accepted and it's acceptable thinking by everyone in the room including yourself that is the power of, of racism the moment that you can begin to think that I am less than someone else because of the experiences that I've had, the experiences um, that I've seen, and I have no hope. That's where racism has won, and racism has really taken hold and uh, taken root and has been successful. We collectively have failed. We have failed to fight against this evil. We have allowed it to be victorious over us. It has been successful and has won. But we don't have to continue to let it be successful over us. You just cannot allow hate to win in this battle. Don't ever assume it's not real just because you don't go through it. So I would just say listen, learn, and nothing's gonna happen unless you are intentional. I think we need to respond as hard as it is with love and with thinking at the person as a human being instead of as this, some terrible hater and try to figure out, okay, why? What's their story? How were they raised? More people need to talk personally getting to know the people in your lives who have experienced racism and engaging in those conversations from a space of I'm here to listen and learn not from a space of I'm here to be the teacher and do all of the talking just awareness of history and to just learn to empathize or at least try to empathize validating and bringing about awareness to it is huge I mean just acknowledging that racism is still a thing Again, amazing work, everyone. Let's have another hand. Now, we're sorry that Sean Emmanuel Atienza couldn't be here because I wanted to ask him how he got those puzzles to move all around like that by magic. But we do have Michael Proctor here, and he was our, in the 19 to 21 age category, and um, I think we have London Shields here as well. Is London here? Will London come on stage, please? And Angela, will you come on stage as well, please? Angela Starin from the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library Foundation was one of the, here, there she is, great because without her, we couldn't have had this contest. So please give her a hand. Applause 
I'm going to start with you, Michael. Your film, A Call to Fight Lies, Practical Steps to Fight Injustice, won second prize for the 19 to 21 age group. And one of the judges said that it moved him or her to tears. Another judge said, mixing dramatization, news footage, and interviews, this documentary, which incorporates a striking frame device, the victim of a familiar racially based act of violence looking for answers from the hereafter is assembled with notable skill. The interview subjects are insightful and there is a real sense of hope by the end. One of the things that you may not have known if you are not familiar with the case in Texas is when Michael showed the, in a courtroom, there was a, a woman who ran across and embraced a man. The man who was shot, that was his brother. And the person who shot him was the woman who raced, and they, that was showing forgiveness. And it was very, very, very powerful. Um, Michael, tell us why, what inspired you to make your film and how do you hope it can help with racial healing? Yeah, thank you guys for all coming and watching it. It's been really fun making it. Um, and if I were to be honest, um, my motive for making it was I was emailed by my school with this opportunity. And I saw possible $2,000 cash reward, uh, a clear deadline, and a topic to give me some structure to, to do something that I actually wanted to do, which is make a short film. This is my first one that I've ever done. And so with... Uh, that structure that was given to me, I was like, sure, I'll, I'll go for it and try it. And it's a topic that I've never dove into, and I knew it's been a super meaningful one, and I've never learned anything about it. And so I kind of felt a little guilty for not knowing anything. And so uh, through that process, I learned so much. I read books. I uh, interviewed tons of people. I had like 10 plus hours of interviews. It, it was amazing. Um, and so from all of that and from all that learning, um, I would say my goal with this film is kind of like three parts. Um, so I hope that people are moved to vulnerability, empathy, and, and then love. And why I say those three things is um, while doing this, it was really uncomfortable having these conversations with people. Um, but it was like f I was forced to do it because I really wanted to, to bring this to fruition. And after I did that enough and started the conversation, it became easier and easier to have these hard conversations. And it gave me more of a language to speak with it because I talked to other people that are already in it. And so I hope that like with this film kind of produces um, a space to in that calls other people to start talking about these issues. And then hopefully they can be vulnerable in that and become comfortable in that and then share their, their biases because we all have them. It's inevitable. And hopefully they share their biases, past behavior, and then hopefully from that uh, comes empathy and understanding of one another. And I think with empathy, um, we can then feel and we know what each other are thinking, we've experienced it, and if um, a lot of us that maybe don't suffer from this problem nearly as much can empathize with those who do, then I think that is where uh, compassion and love is bred, and then wherever there's compassion and love, I believe there's healing. And um, that is, I think, ultimately my goal with this film is to breed love and compassion for one another, um, which ultimately brings, brings healing, so. Thank you. Thank you, guys. That was beautifully said, and I'm glad that you were honest with us and you said your initial motivation was money because sometimes at award shows, you'll see someone say, I had a dream and God told me I had to make this film. And you know, sometimes money is a motivator. Sometimes there are other things, but through the process, you learned a lot. So thank you. Now, London, we are so glad that you are here. And your film, Racial Healing in Oppressed Communities, won second place for the 11 to 14. And our judges like your historical scholarly approach and the way you illustrated your points using news and archival documentary footage. They said you did a great job of breaking down how racism can impact one's life 
and how to effectively approach racial healing. Now, what inspired you to make your film and how do you hope it will help with racial healing? I Can I take my mask off? So I know once you've had inoculation and a test, that's why he took his off. But one moment, let me check with the stage director. She has to wear it. Okay. Just try to speak loudly and enunciate. So my reason for making this... Microphone closer. My reason for making this film was much like his. I was reached out to by my school counselor and she gave us this film. She showed, an, it, no, she showed us the paper for the film and what we had to do to make it and the deadline. And I had wanted to make this film to show people that racial racism is still very relevant today and to show them that we could heal by being just together. So. And then, I don't know. My goal for the film was mostly just to raise awareness and compassion and get us to a place of understanding where we can meet in the middle, I guess. Where are you in school, London? Kenwood. Okay, great. Thank you. And I want you to know, we're, we're going to have um, answers, because we already, we also asked them to write out why they made them, and we're going to make them available to all of you afterwards. We did a, um, an essay that was, that was widely distributed on the internet, but we're going to distribute it again so that you can know, because we have to do the mask today, but we're going to make sure that you have all of their written responses. Thank you. You have a, would you get your prize? And can we have one more round of applause? Michael Proctor and London Shields. And now we're going to let the lights, we want them to get safely off stage first. You know, sometimes they turn down the lights too soon and people trip. So we're not going to do that today. Lights down. These are going to be our first place winners. It's already 7.30. Oh no, I'm going to be late. Okay, Mom, I'm going to school now. Wait up, you forgot your lunchbox. I'm heading to work now. Okay, bye, Dad. Thanks, bye now. Shoot, 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 I'm going to be late. <laughs> hey, Orange Skin, nice lunchbox. Hey, new kid, come sit by me. Sorry those kids are such jerks. Oh, well, it's okay. Hello everybody, I am Mrs. Harmon. If you have any questions, feel free to come up and ask. Okay students, now grab your vials and we will soon prepare the substances. Hey, look at this. Watch. Oh my gosh! <gasps> hey, why did you do that? I don't know why did I do that? <gasps> Dave, go to the office and the rest of you, class dismissed. Jasmine, what are you doing? I'm gonna help clean up the mess. Well, that's very kind of you.
You know you don't have to help clean up if you don't want to. It's the right thing to do. Thanks. My name's Carlos. I'm Jasmine. Hey, look at Orangey. Why are you doing this? Because you're a loser with no friends. That's not true. I'm his friend. Yeah, I'm his friend too. Yeah, the only reason you're different is because you're a lot meaner, Dave. You're a real jerk. You should not treat another person like that, ever. <sighs> School again. I really don't want to go today. Hey, I don't want any trouble. Sorry about yesterday. I didn't realize I was wrong. It doesn't matter our skin color. We're both just kids. May you please forgive me? Yeah, I can forgive you. Okay, thanks, ma'am. Come on, let's sit down. Are you ready for school? Well, I am now. <laughs> Silence is with their badge. 
seven shots from the back and Jacob Blake's soul remained intact. I'm still thinking of him, and Brianna, and George, and Philando, and Sandra, and Tamir, and Micaiah, say their names, and all my sisters and brothers who lost their lives simply because they were living black in a white America. Never let them silence you. This is what I will tell my future daughter when I have to explain to her how her very existence intimidates the world. Honey, if you ain't got nothing else in life, you got your voice, so use it. My daughter will not know silence. My daughter will know her rights, stand for her rights, and live for her rights. Hush. This is what I will tell myself in my head as I fight back tears when giving her the police talk far earlier than the birds and the bees talk. Hush. 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 I say this as I try to call myself when I think of the possibility of it being my child one day. But no more. We will not be hushed. We will not be silenced. This healing is 400 years overdue and our youth is a change. So I must ask, what if it was you? Or your sister? Or your brother? Or your mother or your father? Or them? Oh, uh, I see no aprons and gloves. They're, in this, they're right here. All right, how we coming? You don't have to ball them up. All you got to do is open it up, fill up your gold, fill up your gold, fill up your gold. Thank you. Thank you. How we coming over here, team? How we doing? The food pantry was started by two nuns in the early 70s as a need, they saw a need for people who needed food in this area. So when I first came to St. James, I was the client. And I had gone through many hard times. And then I came here and, and desperate, being, being desperate in whatever I was going through in life. And they asked me to volunteer. And so as my life was getting better, I was volunteering here. And they believed in me enough more than I believed in myself to be employed here. It's my opportunity, like I said, to give back. It means a lot to me because I know they helped save my life, really. And they helped me, they were a support system for me as I was going through my trials. Why, why are people here today? Yes, and what is the reason that people need food? What are some reasons people need food? Until they don't starve. Yeah. And, but what did you notice we gave out mostly today? Um, our veggies. Okay, produce. We're in what is known as a food desert. Do you know what a food desert is? No. Yes. A place full of food where you uh, give it to people? Well, you're almost there. It's a place where people can't get enough um, food, except especially fresh produce, because grocery stores are so far apart from each other. We ask our clients what were the foods they would like, and fresh produce goes to the top of the list. So we partner with Just Roots, and they have freshly grown produce. And we know that it's, that's the best item that we can give our client. In 2016, my good friend Sabrina and I talked about, you know, what if we started a farm in the city and used that as a platform to grow food for the local community, provide educational programming to, to empower people with skills to grow their own food and build community in the process. I've always been really lucky and very privileged to have access to healthy, affordable food. I understand that, that when I'm talking with people about food, like I have to really learn to listen and be understanding of their situation. Yeah. Of course, building more grocery stores would be one of the answers. It always irks me to see in the poorest neighborhoods the highest prices. It just is so defeating. 
there are close to, I think, 20,000 vacant lots in the city of Chicago that are just being used for nothing right now. If we can use those spaces in a really great way that hopefully helps to change health outcomes in a community, why not use that land for something really purposeful as opposed to just letting it sit vacant? We are right now looking at a space that we are considering to um, partner with St. James and the Archdiocese. We want them to consider allowing us to use this land to do our farming. So if everything works out, we'll be here next 2020. We could have a garden here, which we see would help not just us, but the community. It would be participation with some of the clients. Uh, some of the community would, would participate, hopefully, in that program yes. of the earning. Oh, everything in my kitchen is red because I cook with love, and that's what that means to me. Nobody would believe how much red. I just got to show you. See all of that? The meal is nice, but, you know, everybody can't have the meal, so if you didn't have the meal, Thanksgiving still has to be about something. Before we even eat, we all have to go around the, the table and say 10 things we're grateful for. We just usually forget those 10 things. We, we would take it for granted. And I have my apartment. I was on the street. I've come from the street to this. I am very grateful and thankful. I have had many clients come crying for a lot of things, but they go out crying tears of joy. And we can just make things better, just for that, even if it's for that minute. It took me a long time to realize in my heart, I can't fix it, I can't end all the hunger. But I can smile, I can listen. I'm where I think, I, I know, I'm where I know God wants me to be. Our philosophy of the food pantry is empowerment. So it's about helping not only clients, but volunteers, staff like I, to grow, to go to a better place. I want every person to be able to have access to healthy foods, right? Like this is a really holistic process where people are not just being fed good food that's good for them, but their, their minds and their hearts are being fed as well. It's not just about feeding and stopping you from starving. It's about feeding your soul, feeding your emotions, feeding you in so many ways. It is more than food. It's just more than food. It is a great honor to introduce the films, to introduce the winners of our first place films. First of all, Be the Good by Nico Pacori Robinson, age 11 to 14. <laughs> Hush by Kenya Apanguli. And As We Are Planted by Anna Lee Ackerman. So let's start with Nico. Nico, we quite simply loved your work. Be the Good, um, the judges called your film outstanding, imaginative, and empathetic. They said it was a great use of animation, claymation, and narrative to present the emotional core of these issues. Why did you decide to make it and what did you hope it would do? I've always wanted my films to be seen by a very large audience, so I thought this would be the perfect chance to. 
<laughs> and um, I hope this film would inspire people to be, treat others equally. That's why. So Nico, you said your films. This, is this not your first film? Have you made others? I've made like small things, but not contests. Wow. I want to see your other films, Nico. Let's give Nico a hand. <laughs> You know, and one thing, bullies, it's very, very difficult when a new kid goes into school or goes into a classroom and is confronted with bullies. And one of the things I really liked about your film is that you showed all of the other students standing up for him, for that student. And that's what we have to do when we see someone who's being, uh, you know, unfairly put down or just for no reason, people are you know, just being a bully. So I applaud you for that. Thank you. I wasn't going to ask you this, but it just occurred to me. Have you ever been bullied? No? OK, good. All right. So. Kenya, your film, Hush, was called a powerful, enormously impressive achievement by our judges. And they liked how you engaged the audience using dance, spoken word, poetry, and music. <coughs> Excuse me. Also, you focused on future generations. Why did you decide to make Hush, and what did you hope it would do? Um, so I felt like throughout um, middle school, elementary school, I wasn't getting... Can you put the microphone sorry. a little closer? Yeah. I felt like I wasn't getting the full knowledge that I needed about my own history. Sure, my mom could teach me things at home, but also when I'm stepping out and I'm going to school, I want to learn about my history. And I felt like Black History Month was the only time where I would get some type of knowledge. And it was only about Martin Luther King, Rosa Parks, things that I already knew. So after high school, I decided to go to Spelman College in Atlanta. And if you don't know, that's the top HBCU in the country, and it's an all-girls all -girls school. And it's majority black women that go there. So it was a very empowering experience my first and second semester. And both semesters, I enrolled in a course called African Diaspora. And it's required for all the students. So it just taught me so much more about my history, about things I never knew before. So I included that in my film. I talked about Sally Hemings. If you don't know who she is, um, Thomas Jefferson had a, some, some was a relationship with her. She was 14 years old. I don't think that's a relationship with a grown man. But through that, she had kids who are descendants of Thomas Jefferson. So that was just one of many things I learned throughout school. And I felt like I was also inspired by the struggle and the exhaustion of being a black woman in this country and just having my own experience at 19 years old to say that I'm exhausted. So I felt like this is really personal and it was something I could talk about and just put into my film through words, just having my own family in it. The last person in the film is actually my niece. So I felt like I could end my film focusing on the future. We can change things now. We need to have those conversations so that history doesn't repeat itself because 400 years is way too long to keep repeating these same habits, the same racism, the same bigotry. So I hope that my film is able to change things that way. Thank you. <laughs> and I also love the way that you incorporated other arts. We're making film, but you had dance and you had spoken word poetry, and it's just so, it flowed so beautifully. Thank you. So, what? Annalee Ackerman's film, As We Are Planted, was in our 19 to 21 age group, and you were a first place winner, and one judge said, that it shows great promise in the documentarian's potential and, their, and your care towards your pursuit of educating viewers about food deserts, urban farming, and the healing power of community. 
it addresses not only racial healing from both people of color and white perspectives, but also through meaningful action and change. Another judge said this documentary has two killer ingredients, a crisis and an inspirational person trying to solve it. Simple, but never slight. The filmmaker keeps pace with the imperative topic too. Anna Lee, what inspired you to make as we are planted and what do you hope it can do? So I uh, recently graduated from Columbia College Chicago and this was part of my capstone project. Um, I started this in the fall of 2019. Um, and so when it came time to figure out what to make this project on, um, I volunteered here at the farm once for work. I thought it was an incredible experience. I had no idea that, that urban farms were a thing. Um, and so they graciously let me document their story and, 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 and share their, their impact on, on the community um, and the rest is history. Um, but I really just hope that to, um, for this documentary to bring awareness to this issue of food deserts um, or more um, correct, correctly known as food apartheid um, as it is a very holistic issue because if you don't have adequate access to healthy and sustainable food options, that leads to unhealthy health outcomes um, and so on and, and so forth. And so I think I just wanted to bring awareness to this issue of just the lack of nutritious food options that is happening around the corner from us and we might not, and we might not even know it. You know, one of the things that we did as we were looking through the, all of the films, we wanted to make sure that there was kind of a, a um, to show the diversity in the type of films. And I don't mean racial diversity, I mean in the, a difference. For instance, your film showed that through food, how food heals. When people think about racial healing, sometimes they think of only confrontation but there's community action, there's feeding, there's somebody taking a step and saying there is a problem and this is how we're going to solve it. So I love that each of your films did something in a different way. Now let's get your prizes from Angela. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and the last thing we, before we uh, close is we'd like to have the judges who are here and the um, seminar instructors come up to the stage. I know we have Sarah Adamson, we have Niani Scott, we have Omar Mosafar, we have Sean Taylor, and I think we have Lillian Kalfi. And if there's anyone that I didn't mention, please come up on the stage so you can take a bow. <laughs> Niani. Omar, oh, oh, there's Lillian. Oh, I didn't, mm, she's wearing something I hadn't seen her wear before. Okay, Sarah Adamson and Sean Taylor. And, oh my God, Sue Ellen, I didn't know you were coming. This is Sue Ellen Chetunia. She was an Ebert Fellow. She's originally from Zimbabwe. She's won so many awards in this country. I did not know she was going to be here today. Sue Ellen Chetunia. <laughs> These judges had to watch all of the films in their age category, and some of them also did seminars for us in the beginning. Is this Veronique? Yes. Hester, I didn't know you were here either. Come up, there. Veronique. Thank you. This makes me so happy because the judges would call me 
or send me messages after they watch the films and tell me how emotional the films made them feel and how the hope they have for our future, seeing what the young people, because you first identify a problem and then solve it. Because we also were looking for solutions, not just problems, but solutions. So thank you, all of our judges and all of our seminar instructors. And to the audience, thank you for coming. We hope you found today's premiere as meaningful as we did. In making art about racial healing, these young people bravely took on a challenge that has baffled our country for hundreds of years. There was a great deal of pain in some of these films, but there was also hope. Racism hurts all of us and prevents us from relating to and valuing one another. We applaud these filmmakers for shining a light on the pain of so many people's collective and unique experiences with racism, the harm that it causes, and the importance of overcoming it. Your efforts inspire us all and gave us great ideas about how to go about the necessary work of building respect for the worth, the dignity, and equality of every individual in our diverse society. These winning films will be distributed to schools throughout the state, along with curriculum to help teachers start discussions about race and racial healing. We look forward to seeing what our filmmakers will do next, and we have no doubt that their compassion and creativity will shine on as they lead us into a brighter, more just future. Now let's have all the winners stand for one more round of applause. Stand where you are. Thank you, they are all so beautiful. I, I love this, I love this day so much. And I wanna tell you, our filmmakers went away with prizes, but we have swag for the audience too. So on your way out, make sure that you grab a bag at the exit to the theater, and don't forget to validate your parking. Stay safe and take care, thank you.